Hello everyone and welcome back to set six and today what I've got for you is we've got the next episode of the massive mega hit series oh yeah the big seven where what I do is I get your favorite content creators and I ask them seven questions about Final Fantasy 7 and Final Fantasy 7 remake it's a really simple premise but some of the conversations that we've had have been amazing and we've got another one tonight we've got the amazing Lully Bunny so do you want to introduce yourself let everyone know what it is that you do so as you said, I'm Lily Bunny. I have I started streaming uh, September of last year. I do RPG and indie games. My favorite game is Final Fantasy VII. Correct. I've been a fan <laughs> yes, I've been a fan since I was 14 years old. Over 15 years ago, God. Um, and I I make content on YouTube, mostly highlight videos of my streams. But lately, I've really been getting into trying to discuss lore and world building of Final Fantasy VII. It's something I've wanted to do since I was a tiny teenage girl who was just madly obsessed with this game. Yeah. And yeah, I'm I'm kind of, I'm coming back into the, the fan community for this game. I left it a long time ago due to some unfortunately negative experiences, but I'm trying to step back out and kind of be a positive counter energy to some of the negative yes energy yeah because there definitely is pockets of negativity in the community shall we say mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> and it's, dif just, it's difficult shit. it is difficult though because you've got to navigate that minefield you don't want to make everyone hate you because then they're not going to come and watch your videos <laughs> but at the same time you've, you've got to kind of like sometimes be like no stop <laughs> yeah exactly exactly mm -hmm. that's yeah, brilliant I'm and really... sorry go on oh no sorry um, I'm, I forgot, I realized I forgot to mention, I'm on YouTube, Twitch, uh, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, all as Lully Bunny. There are little, there's variations with the underscores, but it's all Lully Bunny. Well, what we'll do is we will make sure that all of those variations are down in the description below. So if you've not got Lully Bunny followed, oh, can't even speak. If you've not got Lully Bunny followed on your content, or, you know, on like your YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, all of that sort of business, it, the links are there. Get following. It's the best thing to do. It makes sense. Also, don't forget to drop a like on this video and subscribe for future content. There's going to be a load more episodes like this, as well as theory crafting content alongside. So, you know, stay tuned for that. But I think what we'll do is we'll jump straight into the questions, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that sounds great. Brilliant. So the first question that I'm asking everybody is, what was your first experience with Final Fantasy VII or the compilation? Like, how were you introduced to Final Fantasy VII? So... Actually, I was first introduced to Final Fantasy VII through the original Kingdom Hearts game. Yep. Uh, what had happened is, is I finally got to the Coliseum and Cloud walked by and <laughs> my jaw hit the floor because he looked so cool. And the first words out of my mouth was, who is that? I hope he's not <laughs> evil so I don't have to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, it was immediate. I loved him immediately. And so then I had to find out where he was from. And at some point, I had some friends who got their hands on the Advent Children film. They're like, oh, he, that character you like is in this movie. So I watched Advent Children before I even played the game. Right. So I didn't know. I was probably 13 or 14 years yeah. old and I didn't really know what I was watching, but I was just like, I don't care. It's, it's got my favorite character in it. <laughs> and I watched that and then I had a friend my freshman year of high school. He let me borrow his original copy of Final Fantasy VII. So Good I man. finally Good man. Play it. <laughs> and I, I remember the exact date I beat it. It was February 14th, 2007 was the day I first beat the game. Nice. It was and as the credits were rolling and I was crying, my mom opened my bedroom door with flowers and chocolates and I felt <laughs> like freaking Miss America. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. I love that. Just opens the door and you're there in front of the PlayStation and the TV in tears. Like, oh, what's going on? She looked at me like I was insane. She's like, are you okay? <laughs> no, I just beat my game. So was that, I know that you'd played uh, Kingdom Hearts before. So was Kingdom Hearts your introduction to JRPGs and then you kind of went further into it with Final Fantasy and everything like that? I think so because i'm pretty sure playing like breath of the or not breath of the wild excuse me breath of fire 3 and what a game that is Mr. musashi 
uh, Threads of Fate, those games. I'm pretty sure I played all those after Final Fantasy VII. Yeah. And I know I've heard some people consider the Legend of Zelda series JRPGs, and some people don't. Yeah. But that was my very first, like, I guess, video game that I played and beat when I was, like, seven years old. So nice. I'll bring up time. Yeah, so, so yeah, you were possibly, depending on how you look at it, you were potentially from the very start. Yeah, it was one of my first games. Like, my family, my mom and my grandma and grandpa, like, they had this little, what is it? Is it the Super Nintendo with, like, the Duck Hunt game and, like... Oh, that was the NES. Games. That was the older one. Yeah, yeah. That was the and first yeah. one. And I remember they, they have stories of me playing this game and I would I was like five years old and I had that little square controller and I yeah. I would do this thing where I would I would push the controller up when I needed to jump like I was giving him more momentum and stuff. Yeah, you see people do it with racing games all the time when they're leaning into the corners and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah. I still do it sometimes. Yeah, but yeah. It was, oh, <laughs> oh no, that's brilliant. Uh, so with Final Fantasy Seven, what was what would you say the biggest way that Final Fantasy VII has influenced you as a person? Like, did it have a big impact on you in any way? Yes, because, I mean, there's so many different angles to how this game impacts me. I always tell people that I relate the most to Cloud, but Aerith is the person I want to be. Like, I'd want to grow up to be her, which yeah. is really funny because people would kind of assume that, like, I would relate most to Aerith, but I don't. It's actually Cloud because he has, like, the, he has all this trauma and like he doesn't seem like a person that really likes himself very much and he doesn't really know how to interact with others and yes. I really related to that as a kid and seeing someone like that who gets to still be the hero who gets to still have friends by yeah it gets to go through all that and come out the other side yeah that meant a lot to me growing up to see that and then also like I look back and I'm so like I care a lot about things like civil rights and like climate change and things like that. And I'm looking, I'm like, well, this game meant so much to me. It seems like it's really impacted the way I view the world, probably. Like, I'm not really surprised that I care a lot about climate change. Considering well, it is like the whole, the planet and looking after the planet and becoming the stewards of the planet. It's a massive thread in Final Fantasy VII. And a lot of people, like I was saying this with Baby Seal, uh, a lot of people, because of the world that we live in now, it's like a secondary thought to people. It's like, oh God, climate change. But back then, like, especially in the 90s when the game dropped, people weren't really talking about it. So for a game to come out that focused on it so much, it was it was definitely amazing. I can see why it's had such an impact in that way. Mm -hmm. And I think playing it at 14 years old was a really good age too, yes. because I mean, when you think about it, Cloud was 14 when he left his hometown. That's like a, the perfect like coming of age time to get these very adult topics kind of thrust on you because you're you're coming into the adult. Reaching that point, yeah. Yeah. So I think if I were to recommend somebody to go back and play it, like if they want to introduce it to their kids, I would say 13, 14 is a really good age to start. Yeah, because you, you've you've got enough of an understanding of like how the world works and things like that to at least get the concept. Like if you're like under ten years old, you might you know you're probably going to struggle to understand some of the more nuanced things that are going on in the game. But yeah, by that age, you're definitely at the point where you know you can absorb that and take it on and formulate your own opinions on it as well. Yeah, exactly. And there's going to be a lot more for you to relate to as well at that age. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Now. The next question, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this one. Uh, we'll see. But the next question is, which character in the compilation of all of Final Fantasy VII would you say is your favourite? Now, I'm seeing that little guy just over your <laughs> shoulder there. Here, yeah. He's, he's my favourite, and I don't care if that makes me a basic bitch. Like, <laughs> he's my favourite. You're not the only one. You are not the only one that said it. Okay. That's, that's good to know. Yeah, he's, he's my favourite mostly because, like, and I think this is something people kind of give the character a hard time because yeah. he feels like, you know, the very typical emo, like, main character. But the thing is, is he's also one of the most prominent mentally ill characters. I don't feel like we get enough of that, at least in the in the form of a hero. Yes. And I, I really love to see this character who, he's very, very mentally ill. And he also struggles with his self-worth. He's suffered a lot of trauma. And just to see 
to be able to watch him go through that, but to also see that he has a support system that's there. And that's something I, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I do love how Sephiroth and Cloud are like foils of each other in the yep. way that they both have severe trauma and severe mental illness, but Sephiroth does not have a support system and Cloud does. Yeah. So to see that difference. Is it's amazing. a very, it, it kind of puts me in mind of things like Naruto and stuff like that, you know, where you see like the difference between Sasuke and Naruto. Sasuke is off doing his own thing and kind of trying to get his power, whereas Naruto's got that support network around him of people lifting him up and helping him. And, you know, you see the differences there. And yeah, it's, it, it definitely plays the same with Cloud and Sephiroth because the shit he goes through, Sephiroth, realistically, he goes from being like the big hero of Shinra and the world, basically, to public enemy number one and trying to end the world and everything because his whole worldview just gets shattered. Yeah, he, he's been wronged severely. Yep. He doesn't have anywhere to catch him. Yeah, whereas Cloud, he's got like all of his friends around him, he's got Tifa to support him through like the whole live stream scene and everything like that. He's got those anchors back to his past so that he can, you know, he knows he existed, he knows that he was a real boy, basically. Yeah, yeah. Because that yeah. was that was a lot of the thing that Sephiroth was trying to play on him, wasn't it? Like, you're not real. Come on, man. You're a puppet. Yeah. <laughs> you're not you don't matter you're yeah not you don't exist and it plays into a lot of the insecurities that cloud had anyway purely because of like the not making it into soldier and stuff like that yeah yeah no i think it's one of the more poignant parts of the story yes. and i don't even know if they did it on purpose but i i do know that a lot of times humans will add messages into stories on a subconscious level because they don't realize yeah. that it's something that they needed to tell and I feel like that's something that's in there, that it's so important. This isn't just a story about good versus evil. It's a story about a, a society that takes care of its ill, whether it's yeah. mentally ill, physically ill, or, or whether they don't, and what the repercussions of that are. Yeah, and like you say, it's definitely something that's not really touched on that much. Even even nowadays, I mean, it's it's starting to come more to the forefront nowadays, definitely. But like back then in the 90s and the noughties, it was never a thing, never a thing. And like you say about that scene as well, there are a couple of scenes in Remake where they really need to be careful and not slip up. And I feel like that is definitely one of them, 100%. The other yeah. one's Cosmo yeah. Canyon for me, by the way. <laughs> you can't mess yeah. Bugenhagen up. That, that, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Now, and he, he offers so much like intrigue because he, there's a lot... The fact that he loves machinery and apparently used to work for Shinra and then Professor Gast brought him some machines. Yep. The fact that Professor Gast and Bugenhagen have crossed paths, like there's so many questions there. And this is the thing as well, like in the original game, you get that connection between him and the planet. Like when you go into his observatory, he, let, he lets you hear the sounds of the planet. And it makes me think that he's going to... He's going to be one of very few people in Remake that knows what's going on, or at least has an idea that something's going on. Like, he'll be on to the fact that something's not right about Sephiroth, for example, or there's an imbalance in the planet. I think that's what he might kind of twig onto, mm -hmm. something like that. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I'm going to feel... The way he's going to behave is probably going to feel very similar to the way that Aerith and Sephiroth have been behaving so far. Yes. Yeah. That, that kind of... It's like that foreknowledge and the kind of this they say things but they don't say too much especially Aerith, she's very restrained with it at certain points because every time she goes to do something the whispers come for her so she has to kind of be careful what she says whereas Sephiroth's just running around saying whatever he wants <laughs> yeah and they also kind of they imply at certain points that Aerith was treated as kind of a weirdo for her power. So it also could be her restraining herself because she doesn't want to push people away. Yeah, I mean, have you read the Picture in the Past story? I have not. First off, I've that. got a video on that, so check that out. But, <laughs> but honestly, it's a really good story. I won't go into it because I don't want to spoil it for you mm -hmm. because it is a good story to read genuinely. Um, but there's a few things that happen in that that kind of play into the same sort of thing that you're saying now, you know, about her not being comfortable with the powers that she's got and things like that. It's well worth a read. I I'll send you a link. <laughs> um, I would have felt, this is, I found a translation. I had to. <laughs> now, we're on remake territory. So really, br well, not briefly, but I'm going to jump into remake territory and then we're going to jump back out of it for a second. So how do you feel about remake so far? Where are you at with it? Because the community's 
it's there's, there's definitely a split it's not a 50 50 split but there's definitely a split where where are you so to give background context i was one of the very few at least it feels like very few one yeah. of the few people who did not want square enix to ever touch the game again i can understand that on compilation i didn't really trust that they could do it in a way that felt like they maintained the original essence because i'm not a fan of crisis core or third Cerberus, no matter how much i laugh at them and play them <laughs> however once the fact that they're doing it i can't fight it and because it's my favorite game i i said this before it's like you're touching something that matters to me and you're doing stuff. I can't look away. I don't necessarily agree with everything you're doing, but yeah. I'm here for pride at this point. Like, where are we going? I'm going to enjoy theorizing while I can. Uh, the original game will always be there. Yes. And there are things they have done very well. So I'm hoping, like, there's definitely moments in the game where I'm like, that was so entertaining. I enjoyed that so much, or that was just really cute for me because i i do like the dynamic between cloud and Aerith. i yep. just all the scenes between them like getting to see and hear them communicate like we never we didn't get that before so now we get to have that and it's really nice it feels like revisiting a memory yes. that you didn't know like you totally forgot you forgot yes so it's like, oh, like and it, it feels really nice and like the gameplay is fun like tifa i love playing with Tifa and your yes. party like she just zaps around she's so fun so I mean and also like in the end when you're fighting Sephiroth when because for me Aerith showed up first and I yes, didn't I... know what to expect right so when she showed up I started flipping out because I've never wanted anything more in my life <laughs> to kick Sephiroth's ass let's go I was, <laughs> I was like crying shrieking well yeah because she doesn't get an opportunity in the original does she she gets no opportunity no, she doesn't. So it just, I don't even think she ever speaks to him. Nope. They've yeah. already said more in Remake than they ever did in the original game. Yeah, because I, I don't actually. Does she say anything? See, it depends if you have Aerith in your party, you know, when you go to the Temple of the Ancients. But he's not really talking to any one specific person, is he? He's just kind of I'm... vocalizing in general to anyone who will listen, like, I am Sephiroth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is it. But on remake, I, I I definitely see what you're saying. Like when they announced it, I was like, "Oh, oh, whoa! This isn't going to be like Dirge again, is it? Come on!" Like Crisis Core, I can tolerate. I have big issues with it, but I can tolerate it as long as we kind of take Genesis out of the reactor scene. I'm I'm pretty okay with Crisis Core. I think one of the things that a lot of people have said it the concepts in there are good. It's the delivery that wasn't good. And that's where the worry comes in for Remake, that the delivery isn't going to be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely, when I look at Crisis Core, like, I think they missed a lot of opportunities yes. with it as well. I think because, because Crisis Core is supposed to kind of fill in what we didn't get, like, yeah. like Cloud's past, and kind of explain that, but through Zack, because Zack was the one doing everything. I kind of felt like there needed to be more scenes between Cloud and Zack together to really establish that like connection between the two of them. Yes. And I, I felt like we didn't get enough of that. I felt like I felt like the execution with the Genesis and Angel stuff was really weird. It was car like, it was I, quite corny. Yeah, it was corny. Genesis, I just he just cracks me up. Like I I actually like <laughs> because he's so absurd that I'm like <laughs> Any minute you're on the screen, I'm laughing. So with, Angel, <laughs> with his bothers, apple, <laughs> yeah, with his apple. But like with Angel, what bothers me about him is that like he uses all these like really big words like honor and duty, but the game never actually defines those terms. So he's saying a lot of nothing, and it sounds deep, but it's not. It's not. And that's yeah. To me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is it. There was a there was a definite lack of depth to it. And uh, the gameplay mechanics as well, like, I really wasn't a fan of that combat system, to be honest with you. I liked the Materia Fusion stuff. I mean, I really love the Materia Fusion stuff, and I'd love it if they bring that into Remake, because I think that could be a really good system to get in there. But as far as the combat, you know, with the spinning reels and everything like that, I was just like, come on now. Yeah, I didn't like the slot machine, because yeah. it just, it felt like, it was so random, and like, the fact that your level up, like, granted that your likelihood of getting the level up would increase based on your experience points, but just 
that you would you would have been grinding forever and you just wouldn't hit your level up which oh that sucks i hate the, it. the thing is as well i think i almost have this little weird feeling that you know in the final fight that's where that reel makes sense because you get all those little scenes with and everybody yeah, yeah exactly and i kind of feel like they wanted to have something like that in the final fight and they thought fuck it we're just adding it for the entire game it's in <laughs> yeah they, they had a vision for the end and then they were they tried to make it like relevant what? to the whole thing because how do you just put a random slot machine at the end without context people would be like this is a weird way to do that yeah that's a, it's just a, it's just a weird little feeling that i've got i'm probably wrong but it's just a weird little feeling that i've got oh i love it oh, but, so you're quite you're kind of yeah you're you're kind of where i am like you're along for the ride it's final fantasy 7 so you're gonna you're gonna engage with it because of what it is and let's see what they do yeah and i'm gonna i'm gonna offer my critiques and criticism i mean if there's anything that uh this game has taught me it's that you should always question major corporations yes you know don't just blindly like you've like, got to keep horrible. them accountable you've definitely got to keep them accountable yeah, so you can always call them on things. Like, I mean, it's funny. It's a game that's about anti-capitalism, and it's so beholden to capitalism. Yes. Like, that's just how it is. So I'm the type of person, like, I, I give the devs their humanity, but I also realize they're still under a, the corporate thumb. Yeah. So, like... Yeah, they've got orders coming from above that they... I'm not going to either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're, they're not completely absolved of all guilt, but they've definitely got external influences that kind of push them in a certain direction. And, like, with Remake, the, for every... Like, the scene, the chapters where you meet Aerith for the first time, like, up to that point for me, the game was like, yeah, this is okay, this is okay, this is good. I hear those chapters and I was like, oh, let's go! <laughs> and then Wall Market as well, that was another one that was like that. But for every chapter like that, you've got the sewers. Yeah. And that's, a lot of yeah, it, 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 it was a good game. I enjoyed it, but like I, I've still got some concerns, but I'm hopeful. That, that's where I'm at, at least. Yeah, I'm trying to, now that I've seen a little bit more, I've been talking to other people, like me and my friend B, her username's Eyes on BB, we actually discuss theories about what's happening in the game a lot. She was actually the first person that I ever spoke to that said that I think Zach is in the live stream yeah. and that they're going to take uh, themes from Maiden Who Traveled the Planet and allow Zach to meet all these characters who are supposed yeah. to be dead. So like Jesse, Biggs, and Wedge, they're not really alive. They're in the live stream. They're in the stream. live stream, yeah. Mm, they're going to meet with Zach. She, before Intergrade even came out, she said that. She said to me, I think he's in the live stream. I think it's kind of like a, a what was it, Jacob's Ladder is what she told me. So I just want, I also just want to give her credit for that. I I heard it from her before. Anyway. That's where I heard it. <laughs> and, so, and the more, the more that stuff comes out and the more I think about it and talk about it, the more I'm like, Makes I sense. absolutely correct. Yeah. yeah, I was definitely initially, I was kind of like, is it two timelines? Is that what's going on here? And a lot of my early focus was on that. But then it's become more of a thing now, like have things been happening in the memory of the live stream? Like, is it possible that remake itself existed in the memory of the live stream and now zach's kind of gone into that and the party have come out of it possibly like they've kind of swapped yeah. positions there's so many possibilities though it is really difficult to like pin anything down at the minute i'm looking forward to that first trailer that we get i know i am i'm curious to know when we're gonna see something for part two yeah i'm hoping or if we're gonna DLC before then. Yeah, I'm hoping before the end of the year we'll get a little thing. I don't think we'll get anything big, but I hope we just a tidbit, yeah. just a morsel, anything. <laughs> anything. Just, yeah, just, even just to let us know that you're still working on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've got other things coming as well. We've got the Traces of Two Pasts book that's coming out, which is Aerith and Tifa. Uh, there's a, another Ultimania coming in the next few days as well. I think the Materials right. Ultimania Plus. So they're still churning things out for us, but yeah, give us Remake 2 news, please. Yes. <laughs> Begging definitely. you. <laughs> now, the next question is going to be back to opinions. So we've asked you who your favourite character is. On this one, I want to know, in the compilation, there's a lot of different music tracks and a lot of different music tracks that mean different things to different people. Is there a track in the compilation that kind of stands out to you the most as your favourite? It's a tough one. I know. I know. That's hard. <laughs> Hmm. You can answer a few. You can give me a few. Just ignore me asking for one and give me a few. <laughs> um. Well, see, for me, all it takes is that main theme. 
that yes. that main theme, especially played on a piano, like that just takes me right back home. You yeah. know, where like this is this is familiar. This is my childhood. This yes. is safe. I I really love that. Uh, if I'm about to jam, Birth of a God, hands down. That that is the most underrated boss battle song. Everyone's out here singing the praises of One Winged Angel, but I'm like, I don't know, Birth of a God goes off. Yeah, and I'm I'm looking forward to what they do with it in remake because like that Genova fight at the end of remake where you get the Genova theme, like you get to the the I think it's the fourth phase of the fight, it's the last phase of the fight, and you get the old Genova melody kick in, and oh, I lost it. And, oh, <laughs> speaking of the remake, the remake soundtrack though, I think for me, besides the the seven minute long version of Let the Battles Begin, where they they actually um, sampled Hurry Up. It's literally two notes, but it's in there. And the fact that they put notes from Hurry Up into Let the Battles Begin to add that feeling of like, oh, like we gotta go, there's urgency. Yes, let's go, let's go, yeah. you know this. <laughs> uh, yeah, like when I heard, the first time I heard that, I about lost it, cause I was like, that's <laughs> cheap. Cause anyone who's played the original game knows that sound yep. and to put it in a battle just makes you feel like, oh. It, yeah, it ups so the cool. urgency, definitely. But for my favorite, like, I guess, new track, it's Rufus Shinra's theme because they also, they sample the Shinra theme. And I think, is it Let the ba not Let the Battles Begin, I think it's Those Who Fight is in there. I, I just love all these yeah. character themes where they combine different yeah. themes to tell you who the character is. The fact that they include the Shinra theme in Rufus's, it tells you that his association is with Shinra. Yeah. And I love that. Jim. Yeah, and it's it's something they weren't really able to do back in the day because uh, even though when they came to the PlayStation, it was like they had all these new tools in comparison to the SNES, it's still nothing compared to what they can do nowadays. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to some hype tracks coming up in the future of Remake. Good ones. There are, there's also a few that sound very reminiscent of Final Fantasy XIII, yep. which kind of takes me out a little bit, but... I mean, I love 13 soundtrack. It's more for me, like, it, it makes me think of 13 instead of 7. But, yeah. like, ultimately, the the remake soundtrack is just really, really good. Yeah. Uh, there's very few tracks that make me kind of go, hmm, I'm not a fan. Like, I, I can't think of many that I don't like, to be honest with you. Um, and, yeah. No, they're all good. Some of them get you more hype than others, but... Yeah, like, Patch and Nova by Airbuster as well. Uh, I like Valkyrie. Valkyrie's a good one. Yes. Oh, there's so many. Literally, uh, this is possibly the toughest question in the list, to be fair. <laughs> to be honest. Some like, people I... have just been sat there like, shit, what do I say? <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, you know, you have songs you listen to when you want to be warm and fuzzy. You have songs you listen to when you're feeling really grungy, like Vincent's theme. What is it? The Nightmare Begins. Yes. That song? I love that song. Oh my god. I, I just can't wait to hear that one in remake. That's Sid's gonna... theme as well. I'm a big fan of Sid's theme. Big fan of Sid's theme. Gold Saucer, that's going to be quite interesting to see where they go with the Gold Saucer. Yeah, oh, it, I wonder if they're going to offer several different songs, because I know the Gold Saucer theme does great on people after a while. Yeah, so you've so got I to mean, mix it up. There's going to be, yeah, some mixing in there, so it's not as repetitive. Um, well, things to look forward to. And speaking <clears throat> speaking of things to look forward to, next question. See how I did that? That was quite professional. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the next question is, like, what is something that you're hoping for from Final Fantasy VII Remake's future? So what do you want the game to give you now going forwards? I think I've mentioned this before, because I've been playing New Threat Mod on uh, my streams. Yeah. And something that I really enjoy that they added to the game is for instance Barrett you know he has his whole backstory with Coral yes and in the original game you don't get any foreshadowing about this you just show up in Coral and things are happening yep. but in the new threat mod there are several points on your journey where Barrett stops as you get closer to Coral and he says do we really have to go forward with this I don't think we should go this way I think like Let's stop. Let's turn around. And it's so good because I'm like, oh, like, I didn't know how bad I needed this. Like, yeah. I love that we get to see him struggling with the idea of going back because he knows that he's not welcome there. But he also doesn't know how to tell the party that. So it's a really good piece of, like, 
character development and foreshadowing all at once. Like it allows you to see him as this complex character who has a life outside of Avalanche. Yes. And I really want stuff like that. That's stuff I want to see a lot more of. I want to see more of Tifa talking about how she got from Nibelheim to Midgar. <clears throat> we need more Zangan. We need more Zangan. Zangan. Yep. We need way more of him. Yeah. Like I want to know so much more about all these little things because one of my biggest critiques for remake yeah. is that I know everyone loves all the additional stuff with Biggs, Wedge, and Jesse, but for me, I kind of felt like it was unfair to the main cast because our main cast, the way that their development is set up is they get a chapter and then it, you never kind of get to watch them grow or change. Like once their chapter's up, their chapter's up. Yeah. So, like they could have used the time that they gave to Biggs, Wedge, and Jesse to the main cast, to Tifa, who especially needs a, like, I know everyone loves her and she's their fave, but she actually is very underdeveloped personally. Like, yes. she's definitely there as a character to help progress the narrative for Cloud. Yes. But she doesn't have a personal arc. Like, she doesn't have personal goals. Her goals are all kind of related to her. It's all tied up with Cloud, yeah. Yeah, and I feel like she also lost her whole family yeah. to Shinra. Sephiroth. She was stabbed by him. Shouldn't she also have traumatic responses? Shouldn't she also have this drive to, you know, do something with that? Yes. And I want to see more of that in her. I want to see them talk more about how she, like, what she experienced as she healed as she started training under Zangan. Like, I think she deserves a whole lot more because yeah. she just, she doesn't have anything. She doesn't have her own art. Yeah, and I, I do hope that they work it in. And it, like with the Yuffie DLC recently, we've seen a pretty big expansion on Yuffie, like as a character in general. Because I mean, in the OG, there's, there's yeah, barely that anything. Nothing. Yeah, that's yeah. it. There's, there's practically nothing. So if they can do the same sort of thing for like Tifa and things like that, and, and other characters as well, like Vincent, Vincent definitely needs a lot more. Like he's yeah, massive. Integral, the main, like the main meat of what happens. Yeah, he yeah, did so much. He's involved in everything pretty much all the way through the entire narrative, and the fact that he's an additional character in the original game is just mind blowing, because he's there for all of it. Yeah, like in the the that was something that always gets me about Dirge of Service because I don't think it was a bad idea to yeah. make a character or to make a game about Vincent. In fact, I think that's brilliant. I just wish it would have been a prequel, like Crisis Core, and I wish it would have been taking place during his time as a Turk, and we could have played as Turk Vincent. I think it would have been a much stronger game. If we that would have been it. nice, getting all that backstory, seeing the events with Hojo and Lucrezia and all that sort of business, yeah. Building that relationship with Lucrezia and then having to watch through his eyes as she suffers but pushes him away, yes. and he can't do anything. Yeah, it would have been a tragedy. <laughs> I really do hope that we get something like that, because... It is necessary because, I mean, I mean, he's got the proto material, he's got chaos inside him and everything like that. It, like, even if, because they are going to work all of these things in, I think. I think that was the big thing with bringing Nero. Yeah, bringing Nero and Vice into it, it kind of shows that they're going to do something with that. And if Sephiroth's plan is to kind of do the same sort of thing he wanted to do in Advent Children, which was like, take all of the live stream and travel the stars using the planet as a vessel. He's going to need, Omega's yeah, going to be involved. Yeah, Omega's going to be like, um, no, that's my job. Yeah, excuse uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> my title, you're in my seat. <laughs> oh, that'd be amazing, just them two just facing off against each other. What? <laughs> yeah, so Frost fighting Omega. <laughs> well, no, I do think, I, yeah, that is something that I'm definitely hoping for as well. A lot more expansion on these characters because it does very much become like laser focused on cloud and sephiroth at a certain point yeah and it would be nice to see more like i've not played new threat myself and it, I, I like that that it kind of because he would be you know he knows that you're going towards cosmo canyon and coral more uh, not cosmo canyon sorry the gold saucer and coral so he knows that he's come from there he'd be he'd be having trouble on the way definitely and yeah i like that you get to see that that's good yeah, I highly recommend New Threat Mod because it's it's really refreshing. If you like a challenge, it's great too. And there's so many additional things. Like when you visit a town, your party actually goes out and enjoys the town and you can talk to them and have like what you can see Tifa and Aerith like enjoying drinks together and like 
sort you of like they do in Costa del Sol a that, little bit. Yeah, yeah, and you get that at every town. And Love it's, that. It's really, it adds so much life. And like after Aerith passes away in the game, the next day everyone is at the place where Cloud left her, and you can talk to each of them, and they will tell you something to help you accept the loss or to say like Sid will even be like yeah we've we lost a lot of people before I I've experienced this like I can't imagine how you're feeling you know it's that's so good and I think it's so necessary and I want to see more stuff like that where we get to see the characters besides Cloud reacting to yes. what's happening to them yeah because Sid Sid's another one of those characters that his story like mm -hmm. when you fill in the gaps like you have to with a lot of those older games his story is like the journey he goes on from being a bit of a massive dick in the in the early days to the point where he realizes that he's been wrong uh, and you know kind of tries to adjust his ways and correct his behavior like every character's got something like that except for kate sith i fucking hate kate sith but yeah <laughs> <laughs> just get rid of kate sith but yeah other than that i want all of them to get like and reeve as well yeah because he is quite an important character yeah, because he's literally, I think he gets so ignored, even though he's kind of the perfect example of the everyman or the guy who who's genuinely wants to do good. And he he probably also fell into that propaganda thinking, oh, if I work yep. for Shinra, I can do good things for this world, only to climb the ladder. And once he gets high enough, now all of that is shattered because now he can see what it really is like at the yep. top. And he's trapped. And he's he part of it. Because then there's no one to challenge them but i also feel like i'm complicit yeah and exactly because that, that that literally is the story of every working man or woman or you know non-binary person <laughs> well that's how it is you know we all are just cogs in a wheel unfortunately no no that, that's completely true and it one thing that i was talking about with baby seal is that it, the game does quite a good job of in this early stage at least of humanizing the Shimmer employee because you see them going about the normal lives and doing the normal thing. And you, you, I'm pretty sure there's a conversation in one of the lifts in the Shimmer building where you hear someone talking about like how they're not too sure about what's going on. Or it might be when you're in the vents actually on the way to go and listen to them and you kind of hear a meeting that's going on about what are we doing about set to seven, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And it, it, it's nice to say, I hope they do more of it, definitely. Mm -hmm. To show you to show you that so many of these people really don't realize that they are taking a hand and allowing bad things to happen because in their mind they're not they're just like they're I'm just a wage take care of my my family yeah yeah and they they don't know what these top secret meetings at the top are all about it's on need to know basis yeah exactly uh, they just kind of have their little part in it to play so that they can like feed the family and have a house that sort of thing and that that, yeah. that it is it's one of those messages that definitely comes across because like you were saying it, it is like that it, it do be like that it do be like that it do be like that now this is it this is the last question this is the big one though this is the one where i put everybody on the spot so what i want you to do is i want you to make one prediction that you're reasonably confident about for final fantasy 7 remakes future so it can be anything you want i'm not going to pin you into a specific question or just something that you're confident is going to happen in remake okay um well something that i'm confident is going to happen in remake and you can take as a minute I, if you need to obviously <laughs> well, as i said earlier i really do believe that zach is in the live stream yep. i think that's something they're going to hit us with really hard because the more i think about it the more i'm like any other possibility would require too much else on top of it like they would have to then there's so much more explanation there's so much more other stuff like you start to have to bend and flex to make it work whereas zach being in the live stream like Just that's works. the less explanation like yeah. and the more you think about it you're like oh and that that clears that thing that seemed like a plot hole it clears that thing like i think they did do the whole like showing us that zach is alive that biggs and wedge and jesse are alive yep. it was literally just to shock people to be like oh my god what's going on you've changed my game and then they're gonna pull the scotcha like eh, hey. they're still dead. yeah 100 you know uh, we've seen them do it before we know what they're like <laughs> yeah so i definitely think i definitely think zach's in the live stream 
I do wonder if we're going to see Minerva and what her role is, but, oh God, it's hard. This is a really hard one. See, a part of me, while you think for a moment, a part of me thinks that Minerva is... That's what Genesis wanted to see, to an extent. So Genesis has kind of got this... I, I don't know if you watch much sci-fi or anything like that, but, you know, there's always that kind of trope where the alien makes themselves appear in a way that's pleasing to the person that's viewing them. And could it be a similar thing with Genesis, where the planet has kind of represented itself in a manner that fits Genesis's mindset about, like, the, 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 like the whole loveless thing and everything like that, the goddess? Right. That'd be really interesting. Actually, I kind of like that idea of the planet, like, speaking to people in a way that they can accept. Yeah. That would be very interesting. Also, Minerva's just beautiful, so, I mean, he, he's got a great imagination. <laughs> More Minerva. So. More Minerva. <laughs> More Minerva. She's beautiful. Um, hey, this is, this is tricky, tricky, because there's a part of me... That feels like they just might just go crazy with it. Go for Eris, it. Go allow <laughs> Eris to live. Mostly because of the changing fate stuff and because we've already heard that the original game is the bad end. Yep. There's a part of me that feels like either they're either they're hinting at it just to like destroy your worlds, or they're hinting at it because they're, they they keep hitting us over the head with this idea that Aerith's gonna die. Don't get attached to her. Don't like you know nothing. Don't don't. She's not gonna last. Yeah. But I feel like because they're doing that so hard, that tells me they want you to believe it because they're actually gonna be like, well, we're not gonna let it happen this time because we're changing fate. We're gonna let her live, and that's probably gonna piss off a lot of people. Yes, the fan base <laughs> will have a meltdown. They will. And to be honest, I'll be actually really frustrated if they keep doing this whole, like, she's going to die, don't get attached, to make you think that maybe you can change fate only to kill her anyway. Like, that to me is cheap. But <laughs> I can't I can't fault people for being like, well, that was kind of the major theme of the game is this, like, you know, stakes. You, you lose people and you have to yep. learn how to cope with that. And I agree. And that's why I think the original game is just really good. I think... I agree with Night Sky Prince when he talks about, like, when you get into alternate realities or, like... It gets messy. It gets messy. You lose your stakes. It, it messes with the theme of life because life involves death. And yeah. But at the same time, considering the story we're being given, that's kind of what I feel like is going to happen. And it's if they aren't careful, it's going to cause a lot of anger. <laughs> well, yeah, this is, this is it. It's so many people and it comes down to the expectations that we have of what's going to happen and like obviously our expectations are Aerith dies because Aerith yeah. dies so, so if you yeah, take that away emotional scenes in gaming that a lot of people list exactly and this is it a lot of people can't separate themselves from the expectation do you know what I mean so mm -hmm. when you take that scene away from people they're going to be like well I'm done right. look at how people have reacted to Zach yeah, yeah. And some people are super excited, right? They're like, oh, he's back. Yay. Yay. Like the true hero is here. And, you know, but yeah, there's a lot of people who are very much like, oh, but Zach's back. You've ruined the game. You, you've ruined the game. Cloud doesn't matter as a character now because Zach's alive. And it's like, no, that doesn't really doesn't work like that. But I can see why people think that. Definitely. 100%. Emphasize with the feeling of like, don't change this. It's It was so good the first way. Why would you change these really good things when there's bad things to change? Yes. Um, yes. But at the same time, when I look at what they're giving us, I, I'm kind of to the point where I'm like, I feel like if they did keep it the same, it would be weaker. Like the remake itself would be weaker storytelling if they tried to do it one for one in certain areas yeah. because based on what they've built. Like, yeah. and me, I try to look at Remake as its own game. Yep. I try to think of it as a continuation of a story. Yes. If, you, if Final Fantasy VII never existed before Remake came out, people would love this. People would be enjoying the hell out of it. Yep. So that's kind of become my attitude is just pretend it's a little fan fiction or like a, a retelling or, or being like, what if it happened like this instead? Yep. Like, it doesn't even have to be like, 
this is now canon. It can just be like, well, what if? What if it happened this way? It's like, a possibility. It yeah. Yeah. See, I was. That's the bad ending, right? Oh, the bad ending. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> See, but I was very much in the same boat. Like I had these expectations coming into the into remake of it being the original game, but expanded, certain things fleshed out, that sort of thing. Obviously, at the end of the game, I was a bit like, "Well, what? What have you done? What, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah, what's happened?" But I think, like you were saying there, it's a continuation. And for me, when I reframed remake as a sequel. That's when things clicked into place for me. And with what you were saying, that you want it to kind of go different, or, or it wouldn't make sense if it didn't go different almost because of what they've already done so far, I 100% agree with that. And I think the more little changes that we get in the story, uh, Ray Kaufman did a video about it recently, like the butterfly effect. These little changes, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I, I predict that by the end of part two, we're going to be in different territory. That, that's my guess. Yeah, I agree. I think that because they it depends. Like sometimes in interviews, they'll be like, "Oh, it's gonna be the same. Oh, it's gonna be really different now." I trust I, none I, of the words that they say. They lied. They <laughs> lied. I mean, did we learn nothing from The Last of Us? They lied and said that Ellie would not be a playable character, and lo and behold, she was. And yeah. they lied because they wanted people to be shocked when they played it. Yeah. So it, people lie. I don't know why people think that if someone says it in an interview, it is like true, like in Act stone. Done. That means that's going to be. And it's like, one, sometimes the devs don't even know like what something could have changed in a morning meeting yep. before they get the chance to hear about it. So they're telling you something that is no longer true as yep. of you know, recording. So, I mean, that's how fast things can change. It's not even case. just that as well. It's the fact that you you see all these interviews that they drop where they've been like talking about how they sneak things in on each other in the game. So, you know what I mean? Like one dev might not have a clue what's going on. Yeah. Right. It's, not, it's not like one person gets to decide how it goes. It's entire teams of people. And sometimes even the people that don't get a say, they'll just add something goofy in just because they can and it can yeah. get... People won't notice it until you get someone making mods who are mining it. And they're like, what's this? Uh, hello. <laughs> no, but I, I, again, like with the Last of Us thing, it's definitely a market employee in a lot of cases. They want you to think one thing so that when they drop it, bam, they can subvert your expectations and everyone loses the shit. So that, that's what they're shooting for. That's more, that's more uh, advertising for them because now yeah. people are like, oh my God, like we actually got it. You know? <laughs> That's, that's, they love that like the more shock value the better for the companies because big reactions make money yeah definitely definitely even if it's just that short-term burst of money it's a quick injection and they're happy about that that's that's what it's all about at the, at the top at least top. yeah now going back to your prediction really quickly now what you were saying about Aerith surviving, it does have a lot of impact on the game going forwards if that ends up being the case and she does survive. Now, for me, I kind of think that she will survive, but it'll happen later. That, that's kind of where I'm at. Things are going to change to a point where it happens later. But, I mean, if we think about it, the saying that that's the bad ending, like, how can it get any better if Aerith isn't doing her thing? It, it, it is an interesting question, like, what will go down? Will Aerith be able to summon Holy without right. being in the live stream and that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, is I always got the the idea that she actually was successful in summoning Holy before, just before yeah. the sword, yeah. you know, got her. So, and I think because they they show you that, like they show that it glows, it glows, yeah, a lot of her. Hair. And then we see but, at the end of the game as well when you fight in Sephiroth right at the very end, like. I, you know the scene where he's kind of floating in front of like a big cage and you can see Hole inside the cage behind him. So Sephiroth, she's done her job definitely before he kills her. It's just, will she be able, I suppose it becomes stopping Sephiroth at that point, doesn't it? It becomes all about Sephiroth. Because Holy isn't actually what saves the planet. It's the live stream. Live stream. Yep. And a lot of people think that Aerith couldn't, um, bring the planet to use the live stream unless she died. But I think based on kind of what we're getting in remake, they imply that the the ancients actually were very capable of manipulating the live stream. Well, look at what them. Aerith does with that portal that Sephiroth creates at the end of the game. Like Sephiroth creates this portal, and she's like, oh, I'm just going to tweak that a little bit. 
Right, like, I'm just gonna... I don't like how you did that. Yeah, exactly. So, one thing that concerns me a little bit about that is, with the fact that they've gone against the planet now, is the planet going to allow Aerith to do her thing? That'll be interesting, because I think I said this in my talk on SEAL Team 7, where I think that we're it's not even just going to be a battle of, like, external forces, yes. like, you know, versus Sephiroth and Jenova. I think it's also now going to be a battle of internal forces, which will be Omega and the life stream. Because now the planet's going to, like, how do we how do we know that the planet's not going to be like, well, you know what? I had my, I gave it a good run. It's not <laughs> I'm <laughs> done. I, we're, we're going, we're going. <laughs> I'm out. I'm going to head out. <laughs> And then will Sephiroth be cool with that? Like, there's so many. I feel like it's going to be just this huge. It's going to be like the Battle of Five Armies, but it's all yeah. just. Guy, well, yeah, because there's so many different angles going on now. I mean, you've got this Sephiroth that I feel is from the future. Most things kind of suggest that it is Advent Children time Sephiroth ish. But yeah. there's probably going to be a, a Sephiroth that's native to that timeline. And I think we've already seen him in Remake a couple of times. Yeah, we've got two. Know yeah, you've got two fronts there. Then you've got whatever's going on with Zack. <laughs> then you've yeah. got Rufus. Then you've got Cloud and the Parter. Genesis is probably going to pop up at some point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Wu Tai is going to become much is, more of a thing. I think this is going to be like some magnum opus, like some orchestral. It's going to be crazy. I don't think we're going to get... I think after Calm, things are going to go way hey, different than... Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I definitely agree on that. How many parts do you think we're going to get? I liked <laughs> it'll be three. Three's the magic that's number, isn't it? Yeah, that's why I think it's going to change a lot. I think we're going to get DLC in between there, so, I mean, count that however you wish. Yeah. But I think we're going to get three major installments, and that's why I also think it's going to change a lot, because... To keep it in three, we can't get everything we got in the original game. Not with not with the level of expansion we've just had in Midgar. Yeah, they just took like four hours, because I've, I've been playing it a lot recently, and yep. I was able to get through Midgar in almost under four hours, and they've expanded that to 30. So, like, if if that's what we're getting there, I feel like they, they just did that. They They sprinkled in some extra stuff to make people feel like, oh, like this... This just looks like they're expanding on, yeah. you know, the original stuff that was already there. But I also think they're like, well, here's this. I hope <laughs> you like it. Now we're doing what we want to do. Yeah. You've had your fun. Now it's our turn. <laughs> no, but I mean, this is the thing, like you say, like with the level of expansion that they've done in Midgar, the only way that they can realistically keep it the same, but do it in three parts is if part two takes us to... The North Crater, probably. Yeah. It'd have to take us that far. Disc is only end game and all the side quests. If yeah. we want to look at like what content, like technically, Final Fantasy VII is only two discs. Yeah. Of the third disc is a party time boss fight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's all it is. Uh, but yeah, no. I, I always thought way back when, when I heard they wanted to do it in expansions, I was like, to me, the only way they can make that work is if they do each game as, like, each disc. So, like, if the first game ended on losing Aerith. Because I think that'd be a great cliffhanger, too, because then yeah. you're just left with this sadness and be like, what do we do now? <laughs> Help! <laughs> but, no, they didn't do that. So oh. I'm like, well, dang. We got left with this really goofy cliffhanger. Oh, and the other reason... I think it's going to change a lot is because they purposely brought us a lot of stuff from the original game that like they brought it to the end of remake, like cloud going through, what is it? The oh, live streamer to the edge of the, uh, to the edge of creation. Yeah. yeah and, you, and you, it's all, it's the, framed exactly like that it. final fight. Yeah. And I think they did that because we're not actually going to get that this time. Yep. I, I think they're going to change it. So they're like, well, people are expecting this. We'll give it to them, but they're not going to get it the way that they're expecting. Yeah, like, in this first installment, there's some things, like, Advent Children, the fight with Sephiroth, like, that first fight that you have with him at the end of the highway before you go into that scene, that's Advent Children 100%. 100%, entirely. Oh, it's good. I'm looking forward to it. It is, 
it's definitely got everybody talking. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, people are going to be talking whether they're happy or indifferent or angry. I think if anything, there's no way that Square was going to get out of this without being talked about. Yeah, and there were, and there were definitely there was no way they were going to do it without annoying some people or upsetting some people. Oh yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. Society's not ready for all agreeing about something. No, we're not there yet. We're not there. <laughs> we don't even know how to respectfully disagree yet. We'll get. Uh, we'll we'll get people there. We'll keep working on people on Twitter. <laughs> Although I don't think yeah. Twitter's the best place to do it. <laughs> no, it does not allow room for nuance whatsoever. Yeah, like I hate the restriction on characters on Twitter. Like. I know. I need like four tweets to properly say something without offending everybody. <laughs> I will say I appreciate that they allowed us to make threads before publishing so you don't like have one part of your thought and then you have to go and like hit reply and then hope somebody doesn't intervene or interject their thoughts before yours are finished. And then that the whole post like, ruined. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. At least they fixed that a little bit, but it is just not meant for discourse. Needs an edit button as well. Yes. Oh my gosh, yes. The only thing that worries me about that is because we do have so many politicians on it. Like, I would be afraid that they'll say something horrible and then go back and edit it and say, I didn't say that. Oh, well, you do it like Facebook do, you know, so that you can click the edit history and see it. Oh. Because if someone edits a post on, yeah, if someone edits a post on Facebook, you can click edit history and it shows you. Like, with me, whenever I do typos, you can just see me correcting typo after typo. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I will just hold, like, completely delete the whole thing and just type. Again. I've yeah, literally. Like, I don't need some smart Alec coming out here and being like, um, you spelled that wrong. Yeah, because someone 100% will. Mm -hmm. Some teenager who finally, is, you know, they're like, well, I'm smarter Actually. than you. <laughs> 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 oh, I love it. No, oh, that's been brilliant. So that is the end of the questions. How was it? Did, did you... Oh, I loved it. This was actually a really good talk. I love talking about this game. I can talk about it forever. Good stuff. So. Well, there's definitely going to be more series like this coming in the future, so I will definitely be in touch to get you back on. So, really quickly, just before we finish, is there anything else that you've got going on in the pipeline right now? Anything that you want to kind of get people looking at? Any projects ongoing? Yeah, so like I said at the beginning, I am working on making more videos where I discuss the lore of the original game. I like to when I do my analysis of the original game, I try to stick to the text of the main game rather yeah. than like looking at like the compilation. So my next video, Ooh. I already did the one on Sephiroth. The Sephiroth right? one, yeah, it's a brilliant video. That go and watch it if you haven't. I'll link it. Oh, thank you. And uh, so my next one, I wanted to talk about Shinra and their employment of child soldiers which kind of feeds off on Sephiroth and then Cloud and Kuncel and all these other characters yep. right, not in the original game. But, you know, and I was going to see about having a friend of mine who uh, she she and a few friends of mine have done a panel at a con talking specifically about Japan's usage of child soldier tropes in their media. Yeah. And I going to have her guest on that. So that's something I'm working on. So stay tuned hopefully i'll have it out soon definitely keep an eye out for that and like i say so that you can keep up to date with everything that's going on that lolly's got doing at the minute all the links are going to be in the description below and make sure that you follow to click hit like hit follow hit subscribe everything just click at everything the bell all of it mm -hmm. and be sure to subscribe to this channel too oh thank you <laughs> No, oh, we're, we're, we're getting people in. I'm going to start netting people soon and just forcing them to subscribe. That's how I'm going to work it. Uh, Chase them down. Yeah, yeah, just run them down. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Treat, do the Sephiroth thing. Just keep messing with people until they subscribe. Get your own theme song too so they know you're coming. Oh, I need to work on that. Do you reckon New Amatsu would be up? No, he wouldn't. He wouldn't. <laughs> uh, no, but this has been a brilliant chat. Thank you so much for coming on. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on here. Thank you so much for having me. I absolutely loved this. Oh, brilliant. Well, we'll definitely be doing it again. And thank you to all of you at home for watching. It's been a brilliant time. Keep an eye out for the next episode, which will be dropping in a week's time. Keep an eye out for everything else that I've got going on in the channel. I can speak going on on the channel, but more importantly than anything, I cannot speak. My jaw's just gone blah, 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 blah. Don't forget to drop a like on the video and subscribe for future content. But more importantly than anything, have a great day. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>